Okay, guys, here are some renal questions from your world. It's ba it basically covers anatomy, histology, embryology, basically everything on the left side of your world, the subjects on the left side. So let's go ahead and see how do I approach renal questions, or I mean, any questions, any other questions. So first um, advice, and you guys probably already know it, which is reading the last sentence, which includes the question about the, qu like the, the question stem, right? Uh, which basically directs you to think about the question. Is it a short answer, right? Like just a mechanism of action of a certain drug or something so that you don't have to read the whole stem? Or is it a, a diagnosis question so I have to understand exactly how, uh, what the patient has in order to solve the diagnosis, right? So uh, that's the first step. The second step that could help you if you you are running out of time, you know, one of the when I was in the exam, like I was running out of time at the end of the couple, uh, at the end of the you know couple of blocks because I was fasting, and I was very tired, so I just had to depend on test taking strategies to finish the questions quicker. So basically, I read the previous sentence as well, which you know sometimes include the investigations and probably have the diagnosis already done or things that you know or they tell you the diagnosis, right? So sometimes this happens, and I'll show you in some of the questions here. So uh, which of the following is the most is most likely to be found during the autopsy? You can skim through the answer choices, and, you know, I have a pretty good idea what it is right now. I think it's Potter's sequence without even, you know, um, you know, reading the question. So if you skim through the question here, you basically see one, one hour old boy, he has, you know, problems to keep near hypoxia. And physical exam also, you know, is very clear physical exam. So examination, guys, is very important. But sometimes to tell you what is the diagnosis, right? So history is important, yes. Uh, chief complaint is important, yes. All right, but sometimes physical exam and investigations uh, will be given to you in the question, and they're very, very helpful. So it could, you know, shorten your amount of time reading this whole crap, right? So here, depending on this, I already know it's Potter sequence. And for you, uh, for those of you who don't know what Potter sequence is, let's open the whiteboard. <clears throat> so Potter sequence is basically a sequence of events, right? It's cause and effect, you know, so some symptoms have, you know, you see on a in a baby, right? That basically dies because, you know, he has a problem in utero, and you see multiple different symptoms, right? And these symptoms are caused either by each other or by some major event. And this major event is oligohydramnios, okay? Oligohydramnios, or decreased amniotic fluid, right? And it's very dangerous to have a decreased amniotic fluid because amniotic fluid it protects against trauma. It's very important for uh, development of the lungs because the baby inhales some of the amniotic fluid which gets into the trachea and basically helps the development of all the lungs right and also helps the development of the GI tract as well because some of the amniotic fluid is swallowed by the baby uh, in order to help that because amniotic fluid is filled with signaling molecules that help with development of these structures right and also by the pressure of the amniotic fluid uh, pressuring the lungs and helping it uh, fill up basically and develop. Okay, so patients with Potter sequence usually has some some things that you know may have caused the oligohydramnios. Let's say renal agenesis. As you guys know, amniotic fluid has a source, which is the kidney. The kidney makes urine, which basically helps or share in the formation of the amniotic fluid and also the filtration across the endothelial cells of the blood vessels that get into this baby, right? So blood plasma of the mother helps in the formation of amniotic fluid. So if you have a problem with the kidneys, let's say you didn't develop a kidney whatsoever, you will have oligohydramnios, and this will share to different symptoms, okay? Like I said, so amniotic fluid helps against trauma, so the patient will undergo lots of trauma, and this will lead to deformation of the kidney, basically, uh, deformation of the baby, like the, the shape of, uh, of the baby will be changed. As you guys see here, the patient has flattened nose, this because of trauma, bilateral club feet because of continuous trauma in the baby, right, as amniotic fluid protects against the baby. So which, will, which of the following is the, answer, is, the answer, is the answer choice? So renal agenesis could be the answer, because as you guys know, oligohydramnios is a uh, side effect of renal agenesis as the kidney makes urine. Okay. Let's see this question. So which let's read the 
last sentence, which of the following would most likely be found on light microscopy? So they want LM, right? So I have to know what the patient has in order to know what kind of light microscopy does he has. All right, so 43-year-old man. Let's see what the patient has. Okay, shortness of breath and fatigue. That's very general, okay? Don't depend on this crap, okay? Anything, basically, any disease could lead to fatigue, guys. Fatigue is very is a very general symptom. Forget about this crap, okay? Let's focus on things other. Little energy, get out of bed, okay? Same thing, fatigue. Uh, has no chills but experienced recent weight gain, okay? Ankle swelling, so now we're starting. Weight gain, ankle swelling. No prior medical conditions. Hypertension, oh, okay. Perinoria, here we go, right? White blood cells, see? These are the investigations I'm talking about. Your analysis, guys, okay? So you could just, you know, forget about this crap and take a look at the exam physical examination like the edema here and the swelling and the weight gain and look at the your analysis or the investigations that happened. You see per uh, proteinuria, you see a little bit of white blood cells. Um, I think it's normal range, but you see a lot of red blood cells. Normal is under five. So you don't normally see. So this is hematuria, proteinuria, hypertension. This is pretty much nephritic syndrome, right? He undergoes a kidney biopsy, immunofluorescent microscopy finding are shown in the image below. What is that? This is linear accumulation or linear fluorescence. If you guys know the difference between linear and granular. Linear means antibodies against uh, the glomerular basement membrane, right? So uh, linear means the glomerules basically um, light up completely, right? But granular means, you know, a little bit of uh, structures like that, right? As you guys know in the fluorescence. So here that's pretty much linear. So we're looking for something linear here. Okay, which of the following would be the most likely finding on light microscopy? Amyloid deposition will lead to amyloidosis. Amyloid, amyloid kidneys will lead to nephrotic syndrome, not nephritic syndrome, so it's pretty much not that. Crescent formation, so rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis. Well, depending on the symptoms, this patient basically, um, he has over the last two weeks, his, his fatigue has been so profound. So this could be an answer here, but would it lead to... Um, Linear, yes, depending on the cause. So if the cause of the rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis is good, good pasture syndrome, this could be an answer. Okay, so let's leave this for now. Diffuse capillary thickening, what is, what's that? So this is either membrane or proliferative glomerular nephritis or membranous nephropathy. Membranous nephropathy causes what? It causes um, nephrotic syndrome. This is nephrotic syndrome. This is nephritic syndrome. Right, so it's not membranous nephropathy. Is it membrane proliferative? Well, it wouldn't have the linear arrangement of immunoglobulins like that. Nodular glomerulosclerosis. This is basically diabetic, and this will lead to nephro. Um, it will lead to nephrotic syndrome, not nephritic syndrome. Normal glomeruli is minimal change disease, so I don't think it's E. So it's definitely B. Okay. So this is rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis. As I, as you see, guys, here this is the linear appearance. The antibody is basically our anti glomerular basement membrane, but this is patchy as you guys see here. Okay. Okay, which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's finding? Okay, let's see. So let's read, guys. If the, is this is there any physical exam? Let's see. Shows lower abdominal distension with normal bowel signs. Okay, so some abdominal distension. Let's see what's the cause. Penis, okay, normal. Renal ultrasonography and voiding cyst to urethrography reveals a diffusely thickened bladder wall with bilateral vesicoureteral reflex and hydronephrosis. Oh my god. Okay, so we got the diagnosis here. What is the cause of this? Bilateral vesicoureteral reflex and hydronephrosis. Okay, so if you if you guys know the difference between hydronephrosis, like how to diagnose hydronephrosis uh, causes. So it's you know, hydronephrosis depends on the bilateral the bilaterality. <laughs> the bilaterality of the the lesion, right? So if you have a an obstruction here, you'll have just lateral or you know unilateral uh, dilation of the kidneys. But if you have two stones, which is you know very very weird, it, it's usually if if it's bilateral hydronephrosis, it it would usually you know affect this area here. So it makes sense if you have some kind of lesion to have bilateral hydronephrosis. So this is actually bilateral hydronephrosis, and not only that, they, they tell you that there are diffuse thickening in the wall of the bladder. So this is very indicative of one thing. It's literally, you know, in my mind, this is posterior urethral valve 
directly without anything. Without elimination of anything, I just know it's persistence of urogenital membrane, which leads to posterior urethral valve. Okay, we could eliminate other answer choices. Let's see. Congenitally short intravesical ureters. This doesn't make sense because usually patients with short ureters. <clears throat> They usually have some kind of reflux, but it's not that severe. And it wouldn't lead to, you know, this severe hydronephrosis. Usually patients outgrow the ureters and the ureters come back to normal within one year or something. And the, you know, they have no problem later on. Failure uh, of obliteration of the allantois. This will lead to urachus. And urachus, you would have discharge from the, um, discharge from the, if, if you have a, uh, like the allantois, basically you'll have discharge from the bladder outside in the umbilicus, so you have urine discharge. So it's not that, okay? Fusion of bilateral, uh, bilateral metanephros, this will lead to horseshoe kidney. It would lead to, you know, most patients with horseshoe kidney are asymptomatic and they don't have any problems, but some would have, you know, some kind of uh, infections in the UTI, uh, in the urinary tract, like UTIs. But this is, you know, doesn't get anything here. Uh, stenosis at the uteropelvic junction. Okay, if it's if it's a pelvic junction right here, you wouldn't have diffuse dilation of the ureters. You will only have hydronephrosis. And usually this is unilateral, guys. Okay, even if you don't know that, that it's, this is unilateral, usually, even if it's, you know, that it's bilateral, it would cause hydronephrosis, but it wouldn't lead to the thickening of the bladder or the hydro ureters. They say that actually we have diffusely thickened bladder, right, and bilateral vesicular reflex. So that means you also will have hydro ureters, right, because the urine is coming flow, so all this will be dilated, everything, right, including the, the bladder as well. So this makes sense, perfect sense. Let's see the other question. Which of the following is the most likely site? If the fetal, okay, let's read. We could just, you know, see what the patient has. So what does the, the ultrasound examination says? Reveals severe unilateral hydronephrosis. There is no ureter dilation. And male external, so without guys, I just told you, okay? If you have a problem here, it's usually unilateral, and this is ureter pelvic junction obstruction, okay? Very, very easy, simple to understand. As you guys saw, I didn't even read anything. I just read the last sentence, which is this, and the last, you know, physical examination and investigation. That's it. I didn't even read. Well, I don't know what the, that is, right? I don't care. I answered the question properly. Okay, the couple asks, okay, let's see, which of the following is the best response? Let's see. Uh, 25, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Okay, see this? The fetus kidney appears fused. I don't care about any of that. That's the physical examination or the ultrasound or the CT or whatever shows that the fetal kidneys appear fused, okay? So the, we're talking about horseshoe kidney. Which of the, is the best response? This is a behavioral question, right? So let's see. Uh, many, uh, what, what's the best response? And uh, so this is talks about the prognosis of uh, uh, the fetal kidney. So basically the parents are, you know, they're worried about the, the this finding and they like yeah, the, cu the couple asks about implications of these findings and the ways they will affect the child after birth. So they just want to know what leads, uh, what horseshoe kidney leads to. As I said, most patients are symptomatic guys. Here, choice C, okay? And, uh, and a little bit of UTI sometimes. So exactly what I just said, okay? So this is C. <sighs> let's see this. Which of the findings most likely cause the child's condition? Here is an investigation. Let's take a look at what's, what's abnormal here. Okay, hemoglobin is a little, uh, this is a child or a boy, so this is a little bit uh, anemic. Uh, hematocrit, uh, mm, you know, borderline, lymphocytes, for, uh, for, let, let's see, let's see here. Is there any examination here? Okay, examination of the area reveals a small reducible umbilical hernia, minimal clear to straw discharge and erythema around the area. That's basic, you know, uh, think about this, all right? I just told you guys, you know, when you have persistent of the allantois, you have the urachus formed, and the urachus is a channel between the bladder and the umbilicus. So you'll get discharge from the umbilicus. That's pretty much it. Okay? As you see, guys, I, you know, I don't just read the question. I go through the last sentence or the last question, and I take a look at the physical exam and the investigations. Let's see this. <clears throat> a, um, the fluorescent areas on the slide most likely indicate the presence of the following. 
Okay, so they're asking basically what is on this slide? What leads to the lighting up of the flor like the fluorescence here? What what is this, right? So it's either immune compos uh, immune deposits, right? There is no immune deposits here. So this is like the easiest answer. Or some kind of complement protein. So as you guys know, the complement system is basically inactive, a lot of inactive proteins in the blood, and they become activated when you have immune response or antigen antibody uh, reaction. Antigen antibody complexes activate the complement system, leading to you know formation of uh, activated complement proteins like C3, C4, um, uh, C5 to C9. Eventually, this is the goal of the complement system: is to form the membrane attack complex which is C5 to C C9, and this leads to basically formation of pores in the bacteria, whatever. This is the ma basic mechanism of complement system. I'm just reminding you of it, okay? Let's go back. So um, let's see what the patient has. So acute facial puffiness, okay? Easily fatigued. I said fatigued is, you know, crap. Dark urine, okay? Skin infection. Oh, okay. Skin infection and glomerulonephritis. This is nephr nephritic syndrome, hypertension here. Uh, edema here, so proteinuria, so hypertension, proteinuria, um, uh, edema, all that kind of stuff is nephritic syndrome. So we're looking at post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. One of the most common skin infection is st uh, streptococcus, okay, strep, okay, specifically strep pyogenes or group A, okay, group A strep. So, what is in on this? I know that people, uh, children with uh, PSGN have low levels of C3 and C4. So if you consumed all the proteins in the blood by activating of the reaction, so what kind of proteins you'll see here? Of course, it's C3, right? No wonder about that. We just talked about it. We consume all the C3 and C4. So it makes sense that these proteins accumulate eventually in the kidneys, leading to damage, leading to the you know formation of C5 to C9 and also C3B, which is you know a chemotactic agent that gets neutrophils and all that, um, all these white blood cells to destroy the kidney, right? Because they release enzymes and all that kind of kind of stuff, right? So as you guys see here, this is granular. This is not linear, so it makes sense. Perfect sense. Let's see the last one. Which of the following adult deriv derivatives will fail to develop? All right. Uh, if a toxic, let's see, let's see the last one. If a toxic insult occurs during early fetal development, that selectively inhibits the renal structures formed by the metanephric blastema. Hmm. Okay. So toxic insult then inhibits the renal structures formed by the metanephric blastema. You basically have to know what uh, what the metanephric blastema gives. As I explained before, you could you guys could see the real embryology in my uh, video, like on my YouTube channel. You you'll see the real embryology. I talked about the pronephros, mesonephros, all that kind of stuff. So metanephric blastema and the ureteric bud are the basic. The metanephros are two parts of the metanephros, and metanephric blastema forms everything starting from the glomerulus up until the distal convoluted tubule and the ureteric bud takes everything after that, right? The, like the collecting duct, uh, the calyces, the pelvis, everything is ureteric bud, okay? So they're asking if you have an insult to the metanephric blastema, what will be affected? So do we have proximal tubules? We have, okay, distal tubules, because distal tubules, like I drew here, it's a part of the metanephric uh, blastema, right? So distal convoluted tubule. Question nine. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this infant presentation? Okay, let's read quickly. Okay, UTI, retrograde urine flow into the right ureter, so by yeah, yeah, vesicoureteral reflux, uh, one year later, no abnormality. So the patient was, you know, the, I just talked about this, holy shit. Okay, so I just said that, you know, people with short ureters, the usually, you know, for, you know, a, uh, a year or a couple of months, they become very, you know they become very normal and this will lead that's because the retrograde urine flow uh because the short ureter uh goes away because the short ureter becomes longer over time okay last question guys besides the bladder wall which of the following structures is the most is most likely to be penetrated by the trocar and cannula during the procedure okay so i got this question wrong multiple times before so I'm pretty sure if you got it wrong as well 
it's not it's not it's not a problem right because it's you know basic anatomy that you have to know you know where the bladder is located in the peritoneum and all that kind of stuff so it's fine if you got this question wrong in the beginning so let's read so basically besides the bladder wall which of the following structures is most likely to be penetrated okay so let's see multiple attempts at urethral catheterization are unsuccessful ultrasound guided midline suprapubic cystostomy is planned so we're talking about ultrasounded guided urethrography so if this is the bladder right here we're we're putting a needle suprapubic cystostomy so we're making a hole in the bladder because catheter catheterization from the urethra basically was were unsuccessful maybe because of uh, this old man because he have benign prosthetic hyperplasia or something right so it's here right so it probably the catheterization failed so they just stick a needle in the uh, bladder so which of the following is most likely to be penetrated by this you know structure trocar or cannula we use these uh, structures or tools right so which one is penetrated by this like red rod okay is it the anterior abdominal aponeurosis which is the first layer here right of the uh of the muscles of the abdomen is it parietal peritoneum what happens if you basically uh poke a hole in the parietal peritoneum right you will get bacteria inside so this is this is you know di dangerous we don't like that we will not ever penetrate the parietal peritoneum right we could happen this with we could do this with sterility some kind of um, good uh, hygiene but you know this is bad right so i want to show you a picture actually i know it's a but i want to show you a picture here so oh okay so they don't have the picture if you guys see the peritoneum So basically, this is this is the picture I was looking for. Let's put it here so that I can use my mouse. Okay, so suprapubic cystostomy is basically putting a needle here. Okay, so what is penetrated? This is the parietal peritoneum, guys, here. Is it penetrated? No, it's not. Okay, so that's why it's not answer, it's not answer B. Is it the perineal membrane? The perineal membrane is down here. Perineum is this area right here. This is perineum. It's not this, okay? Is it ureter? Ureter is right here. Where's the kidneys? Okay, it's like right here. No, of course not. Is it the vis visceral peritoneum? The visceral peritoneum is this layer, which covers the peritoneum, and every any organ is covered by visceral peritoneum. So the needle is here. It's not here. So it's not visceral peritoneum. So the only one is anterior abdominal aponeurosis. Okay? That's enough for today, guys. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll be uploading much more videos in the like next times thanks